Okay, you can take this off. Oh, gosh. These are just um, challenging times. And uh, you know what bugs me? Bubbly Christians. You know, Christians that walk around acting like everything's just great and, and hunky, hunky-dory, cheery, praising God as if nothing's wrong, everything's right. And I think, don't they know that we are to weep with those who weep? But you want to know what really, really bugs me? Sad Christians. I mean, sorrowful Christians that, that walk around as if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You know, feeling the grief and the so acquainted with grief and sorrow. And I think, well, don't they know that we're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice? That bugs me. But you know what really chaps my hide? Conservative Christians. As if it's all, you know, about conserving the past and nothing ever changes. But what really bugs me is progressive Christians. Because they seem to be like entirely unaware that you can progress right off of a cliff. What about Christians that are all into feelings? You know, Francis is like that. I mean, we'll be having a great theological argument in staff. And Francis wants to stop and know how everybody feels, you know. It's all about the heart, how you feel. Or maybe the psyche, the soul, psychology. Tell me about your mother. It's like, ah, oh, just get sick of that stuff, you know. Some Christians think it's all about the mind, and they're kind of obnoxious and arrogant. I mean, you know some of those, right? And what about Christians who say, well, it's about what you do. You know, it's really about what you do. It's about your strength. It's about your action, heart, soul, mind, strength. They all bug me. Seriously, seriously. Contemplative Christians, don't they kind of bug you? You know the type, right? You're like, well, just get on with it. Get, go on, go med- shut up and just go meditate. That's what I'm always, do your meditation. Or the ones that are into revelations and visions, you know the type, right? They're always seeing miracles, having some word of knowledge or something. I think, well, what makes you so special? But what really irks me is Christians who are always talking about how they're, you know, beloved. Well, I work nonstop, tirelessly, trying to feed the sheep. Well, God seems to bring one trial after another trial, and they just rest their head on Jesus, Jesus' chest. Well, I just need to get that off, off my chest. So, anyway, let's pray. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to preach your word in Jesus' name. John chapter 7, no, John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? People argue about what the these are. I think they may be the fish he caught. But he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, this is a conversation that Jesus has with Peter on the Sea of Galilee after he's been resurrected from the dead, and Peter has denied him three times. Jesus continues, truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will be stretched out, stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. As most of you know, Peter was crucified upside down in Rome under Emperor Nero around 64 AD, about 30 years after this conversation. Only John is thought to have died from natural causes, uh, unlike all the other disciples who were tortured and, and martyred, and John was probably tortured too. But verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The beloved disciple. That's, that's John, as we'll soon find out. He's recording this incident. And by referring to himself as the beloved, I don't think he's saying that the other disciples 
aren't beloved, what he's saying is that that's really the only thing that matters to him at this point, that Jesus loves him. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, the beloved disciple following them, the one who also had leaned back against Jesus, remember, on his chest at the supper, during the supper, and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. What is that to you? There are so many things going on in these amazing verses, and I've preached them in the past, and you can see that sermon online on our website if, if, if you want to. But this morning, I'd just like to focus on that question. What is that to you? What is that to you? Well, so, so look around. Just look at, look at the people in this room, and I'm asking, what is that to you? What are they to you? So find someone and look at them. I'm the pastor. Just do it. If you're watching online, you do this too, and you can look at me if you don't see somebody there. But, but look at them. Look at them. Okay, now I'm going to ask you this question. If God blesses them with a relatively, Scott, look at William. If God blesses them with a relatively long and pain-free life, what is that to you? If they're gifted with prophetic powers and visions and words of knowledge, look at them. What is that to you? If they have a great heart, I mean, they just really feel things well, or a great soul or mind or particular strength, what is that to you? If they're progressive or conservative, bubbly or sullen, what is that to you? Now, hopefully you are aware that I was just pretending at the start of this message when I was talking about all those types of, of Christians. I, I was pretending. I mean, because I basically listed every type of Christian that I, that I could think of. I, I was pretending, but of course I was also not pretending at all. Because there's something in me that wants to own it all. There's something in me that wants to be it all, be the best at everything, including humility. Something in me trying, is trying, is trying to, to get me entirely alone. The king of my own kingdom, the king of my own kingdom of only me, Peter's kingdom. You know, Peter and John were competitors. Matthew records how Jesus called Peter and his brother as they were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And then right after that, just a little ways down the shore, he calls two more brothers who were also fishing, James and John. So Peter and John were competitors. And they both became two of Jesus' closest friends. So Jesus made them into brothers. So you get the picture, right? It's the people that I love the most that I'm also tempted to hate the most. Since second grade, I had a friend named Alan. We played soccer together, ran cross country together, went to school together. But Alan was always just a little faster than me, a little more coordinated than me. He was smarter than me. In high school, I met Mark. No one was as funny as Mark. And I wanted to be Mark. So it made me happy when Mark told a joke and nobody laughed. <laughs> and nobody laughed, but maybe they laughed at a joke I told, or maybe they were laughing at, at, at me. My senior year, the closest thing to a brother that I've ever known was a, a guy named Andrew. He lived at my house, and he was spiritual. You know, the whole spiritual gifts and all that stuff. He even had stories of being miraculously called by God as an evangelist. So, so when he get caught up in some sin, what kind of made me happy? Made me feel better about myself, you know? And uh, when he did not lead people to the Lord, well, that also made me happy. I mean, think about it. It's hard for me to think of anything more corrupt 
or evil than that. St. Paul wrote, we view no one according to the flesh. Now that doesn't simply mean a body. It means a, a body in competition with, with other bodies. It's what Dar Darwin described as the survival of the fittest. It's what Jesus described as sin. It's the desire to beat your neighbor rather than serve your neighbor, sacrifice for your neighbor, love your neighbor. It's the thought that you can win. You can win if only other people lose. So to be the ultimate winner, everyone loses. So Jesus asked Peter, Peter, what is that to you? What is John to you? Which I think raises a fascinating question that maybe we should ask this morning, and that is, what is John to God? Peter asked, or Jesus asked Peter, what is that to you? What is, what is John to you? You know, sometimes... People ask, what difference does our theology make? And the, and the answer, honestly, to me, just seems so large and so obvious that it's hard for me to respond. It hasn't always been this way, but for the last 1,500 years, most of the institutional church would say that the line separating good and evil runs between groups of of people, uh, groups forms two distinct groups, both of the groups created by God. Some would argue that God decided on this division before he created any of these people. And so he chose some to choose the good and he chose others to choose the evil. Others would argue that God will decide on this division after he finds out whether or not these people do in fact choose the good or choose the evil because he just like he doesn't know what they're going to do. You see, either way, if, if this is true, these two groups, then every person you meet could ultimately be someone that God loves and plans to endlessly bless, or someone that God hates and plans to endlessly torment. If you think that God has already decided, it makes you rather cautious about connecting to another individual, right? Do I want to connect with someone that God is going to endlessly hate? And if you think God has yet to decide, it makes you feel like you have to save other people from God, the Savior, while at the same time secretly hoping that those people won't be saved because God might grade on a curve, and so the worse your neighbor is, the better off you are in comparison. So Jesus says, what is that to you, Peter? What is it that John will be exiled on the island of Patmos and receive an ecstatic, breathtaking vision of, of me? What is it to you that Alan is smart, Mark is funny, and Andrew preached a great sermon to people that had never ever heard of me before? What is their difference? What is their individual uniqueness to you, Peter? Is it a gift or a threat? Is it a blessing or a curse? Is it heaven or hell? Does my fiery love for them thrill you or does it burn you? What is John to you, Peter? And so I think we ought to ask this question, what is John to God? And so this morning, maybe we could attempt just a 20,000-foot flyover, simplistic kind of answer based on what we have been preaching the last few years. What is John? What is your neighbor? What are the people in this room to God? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Number one, what is a person to God the, God the Father, the, the Creator? Listen to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3.14. Remember when we preached through Ecclesiastes? He, he writes this, I know that whatever God does or makes, whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has been driven away. 
Well, you see, if you are something that God does or makes, if you are something that God does, well, this verse has some remarkable implications for you, doesn't it? Because nothing, nothing can be added to you. Nothing can be taken away for you, from you. You have already been, and who you will be already is. You're eternal. If you're something that God has done. The reverse verse has remarkable implications for you and for your ego. Your ego, which is constantly trying to add to you or constantly trying to take something away from, from you and tell you that you need to be what you've never been before. It has remarkable implications for you and remarkable implications for everyone around you. Let's take John as an example. What is John to God his father? So um, John, if, if John is, is something that God has done, and, and you could plug in the name of like your neighbor or your wife or your enemy, okay? Uh, if John is something God has done, John endures forever. Nothing can be added to John or taken from John. God has done this, that all should stand in awe before him. The John that is already has been. The John that is to be already is. And God seeks the John that has been driven away. That's who John is to me, says God. And then Jesus asks, so what is John to you, Peter? You know, most of us see a person at one moment in space and time, but God the Father created space and time. For him, you are always finished and always brand new, that is eternal. Even physicists now tell us that if there is a creator, then for this creator, that perception of each one of us must somehow, in some way, be true. God doesn't see one slice of you. He sees all of you beginning to end as if it is finished. We have a hard time imagining that, and yet every father or mother experiences something like that. So, for instance, when I think of my son, John, I don't only think of a successful young counselor in Seattle. I think of that, but I also think of my three-year-old boy in the toy aisle at Walmart, <laughs> having just had an accident in his Superman underwear, and looking up at me with those big, bright, beautiful eyes that reflect my love for him and saying, but you're still proud of me, right, Daddy? <laughs> and I can scarcely contain my passion for who he is and who he will always be. You see, that trust for me expressed in that moment is eternal treasure to me. It's inconceivable to me that he could ever not be. And please understand, I'm just beginning to see. But the Creator, God our Father, He already knows. The first three dimensions can be described with these words. Length, width, then depth. What word can we assign to the fourth dimension? One answer would be duration. If we think of ourselves as we were one minute ago, and then imagine ourselves as we are at this moment, the line we could draw from the one minute ago version to the right now version would be a line in the fourth dimension. If you were to see your body in the fourth dimension, you'd be like a long undulating snake with your embryonic self at one end and your deceased self at the other. But because we live from moment to moment in the third dimension, we're like our second dimensional flatlanders. Just like that flatlander who can only see two-dimensional cross-sections of objects from the dimension above, we, as three-dimensional creatures, can only see three-dimensional cross-sections of our fourth-dimensional self. So God sees all of you. But he doesn't see a long undulating snake. And yet there is something snake-like 
there is something in all evil. There's something evil, like evil in all people, right? So where did it come from? Does God do evil? Well, we've seen that evil really isn't something that's done, but that which is not done, that which God does not do. God is love. Love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things, hopes all things. Love makes you, you. So is there a you that God does not do? Well, maybe there is a you that you imagine that you do. And any you that you imagine that you do is a false you, for God who is love does everything, and apart from him, you can do nothing. So maybe that you that you imagine you do is the spawn of Satan, the father of lies, as Jesus calls the devil in John chapter 8. You have a shadow self. But here's good news. There can be no shadow self without a real self to cast a shadow in the presence of the light. You have a false self, but there can be no false self unless there's also a true self that the devil can tell lies about. No evil without the good that the evil infects. So in the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the line between good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. You have an emptiness in you that is an evil within you in space and time, but God will fill you and has already filled you in eternity. Nothing can be added to you. Nothing can be taken from you. You've already been and will always be. You are eternal. Even if you're still being created or revealed in space and time and just don't know it quite yet. Now, we can't entirely comprehend that, but even physicists say it must be something like that. And lo and behold, Genesis, Revelation, all of Scripture has testified to this all along. Most of you remember this, because we've talked about this a thousand times, right? We exist in time like the seventh day, seven days, the seven days of creation, but the seventh day is also an eternal day. It's the eighth day, which symbolizes an eternal seventh, the Shemini Atzerat, which today actually is, according to the Jews, God's Sabbath, the, the revelation of God's eternal Sabbath. There's a reality in which everything is good. Just as God says at the end of the sixth day of creation, a reality in which it is finished, just as the Word of God says, hanging on the tree in the garden at the sixth hour of the day, sixth day of the week, at the end of the sixth day of creation. Now, if you didn't follow all of that, what I'm trying to say is that your neighbor is an eternal treasure. That love is in the process of revealing in space and time. Your neighbor is a love story that's already been written and yet is waiting to be read by you and by all creation. In the moment, your neighbor is hidden from themselves and from you in the pages of history, yet God knows who they are because he's already written the book. God knows that Peter isn't just Simon the coward. He's the rock. God knows that John isn't simply an angry son of thunder, angry fisherman. He knows that John is the beloved. If you are not created by God, according to the Bible, you are nothing but evil. And actually, you don't even exist. For there are no self-made men. But if you are created by God, well, you're good. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, everything created by God is good. So if you are a thing that God does, then you are eternal. Nothing can be added to you. Nothing can be taken from you. You are a universe of wonder waiting to be discovered in a vessel of clay that will crack and dissolve and return to the earth from which it was taken. So Peter, what is John to you? Asked Jesus. See a problem? 
maybe a, a temporary problem for you? Well, to God the Father, he is the eternal image of infinite love. 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7, a man is the glory of God. What is John to God the Father? His eternal treasure. So what is John to God the Son? Well, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to John saying, this is my body given to you. And he took a cup and he said, this cup is the covenant in, in my blood. Last year, we saw that the disciples would have clearly recognized this as a marriage proposal. In John's vision, the revelation, John sees a city coming down and the city is a bride made of living stones, just as Peter describes in his letter, 1 Peter. In fact, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is the bridegroom and we are his bride. And he quotes Genesis to explain, saying the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In the beginning, Adam, which means humanity, was alone in the presence of God, who is love. In the beginning, Adam, humanity, was incapable of love. So God made Adam male and female and began to teach us all a lesson, a wonderful, painful, awful, terrible, beautiful lesson about love. The first Adam looked at Eve and said, bone, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She is me and me is she. Hallelujah. She completes me. You see, her differences were not a threat but an outrageously wonderful and ecstatic, even erotic blessing, a communion. And then Adam and Eve were not simply two bodies, but one body. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this, anyone joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Whew. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And in Ephesians, he writes, there is one body and one spirit, he even goes on to explain that the mystery of Christ is that the Gentiles, whom he is defined as those alienated from the life of God, he defines them that way in his letter to the Ephesians, uh, but then he says this, the Gentiles are members of the same body. This is the plan for the fullness of time, he writes, to unite, anakephalio soste, to bring together under one head all things in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus saw John and Peter, indeed all humanity, as his bride. And grooms are attracted to their brides, even their naked bodies. Jesus saw humanity as his own bride and his own body. No man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, wrote Paul. The two shall become one flesh. <laughs> wow. Well, check this out. If John is Christ's body and Peter is Christ's body, then Peter is also John's body. And John is also Peter's body. Once you get that, absolutely everything changes. All at once, every difference is no longer a curse. We're having such a problem with differences in our society right now, and I think it's because we don't get this. But, but once you get it, once you see it, every difference is no longer a curse. Suddenly it becomes an absolute blessing. For my neighbor is not a threat to me. My neighbor actually is me. So I have absolutely nothing to win by my neighbor's loss, and until all of us win, every one of us loses. Peter Hyatt does not win the race if only his left foot crosses the finish line. In fact, all of Peter Hyde is guaranteed to lose as long as his body is divided or competes with itself. And so you see, this is the shocking realization. No man, no woman is my enemy. But I do have an enemy. It's the lies that men and women believe about themselves that are my enemy. And our enemy it's darkness, death, division, lies, chaos, and the void that is our enemy. So until we all turn and face the enemy of love, we all lose. For there's one body, says Paul. Alan, Mark, and Andrew are real long, no longer, they're, they're not really a, a threat to me anymore. 
For after 41 years, I've come to realize they're not a threat to me. <laughs> they are me. It was 28 years ago that Susan and I moved back to Colorado from California, and I began to work as a, a senior pastor. And I remember w when that happened, I said to Susan one day, I said, honey, I think I'm going to become a consumer item for religious people. So maybe we could call some of our old friends from like high school and just, you know, form a group. They would help me to remember who I am or to know who I am. So for 28 years, we've been meeting. For years, we did Bible studies, workbooks, prayer times. Now, we mostly just goof around. But I think there's a word for what we do and what we are. And the word is church. And I no longer think Alan is smart. I was hoping he was going to be here today so I could say it right to his face. But I no longer think Alan is smart. <laughs> I think we are smart. I no longer think Mark is funny. I think we are funny. I no longer think that Andrew is the evangelist, so much as I think that we are the incarnation of the gospel in a fallen world. And, and we all have wives, which adds the really interesting parts. So what are they to me? Oh, I'm just beginning to, re to realize they are me. So when I see them, I think, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, I'm not alone. And, and here's the really shocking realization. When I'm around them, at least in moments, I'm not less of the unique individual that is myself. Because, you see, I think that's what we're all afraid of, right? We're afraid of being assimilated into the Borg and just become one more brick in the building like everyone else. When I'm around them, I'm not less of the unique individual that is myself. I'm actually more of the unique individual that is myself. In other words, I'm more at peace with who I am because I'm beginning to believe in who we are, a body. So pop quiz, okay, pop quiz. What is it, when, when, when is a chicken leg most a chicken leg? When it's severed and battered and fried and served to you on a plate? Or is a chicken leg most a chicken leg when it's attached to the body of a living chicken? What is your neighbor to you? Something to bite and devour in order to feed your own ego? Or are they a member of your own body, which is in fact Christ's body? You see, I, I think that final judgment will actually be something like this. That's Colonel Sanders at the pearly gates. Uh-oh. And Jesus is like a giant chicken. And whatever you did to the least of these, the people in your life, you actually did to him. Because even the least of these are members, legs, wings, thighs of his body. The gospel is that even you, the proverbial Colonel Sanders, are part of his body. And he died that you would believe. So instead of consuming your neighbor, you would commune with your neighbor in his love that is life. And of course, Jesus is not a chicken. <laughs> Jesus is the man. The eschatos Adam. Hanging on a tree in a garden at the edge of space and time. And we all are his body and bride. So what is a person to God the Father? Eternal treasure. And what is a person to God the Son? <laughs> Himself. His body. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, said Paul. Crazy stuff. And what is a person to God the Spirit? Well, on the tree in the middle of the garden, at the edge of time and eternity, God the Father, fully indwelling God the Son, delivered up His Spirit, God the Spirit, His breath. That's the Spirit that fell on the early church at Pentecost, and they all began to share everything in common. Not because they had to, but because they wanted to. Because they loved love. 
Jesus said, you will, indicative tense, stating what will happen. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we just saw that our neighbor actually is ourselves, so maybe we will actually love them as ourselves. But now, how could we love ourselves or our neighbor self if we already loved our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? You see, the only way that I can love my God with all I am and all I have and still love my neighbor is if God is actually in my neighbor. And check this out. If God is love, and thus real love is God, I can only love if God loves through me. I don't make love. <laughs> love makes me, right? Love is my creator. You see, it's only possible to love my neighbor if God is in me loving my neighbor, which is in fact God in me loving God in my neighbor, which means that I am being like caught up in this great dance that is God himself, three persons and one substance, this one outrageous, amazing dance called love. Love is who God is and what God does. Love is a decision to offer your life to your neighbor, to bleed for your neighbor. Love in you is the judgment, the decision of God in you, his spirit in you, drawing all things together. Together on Pentecost, Peter, John, and all the disciples were built into a house. Not like the Tower of Babel, built by men, in which every stone is dead and every stone is just the same, but the living temple, in which every stone is different and alive and bound together in love, which is eternal life, flowing from one member to another member, like the blood flows between one part of your body and another part of your body, and then back to the throne, back to the heart. So uh, the life is in the blood. The breath is in, the spirit is in the blood. So what is a person to God the Spirit? His temple. And so a person is a place where you are called to worship God with sacrifice and offering. A person is God's temple, which is his home or, or her home, because God's Spirit is described as both female and male in Scripture. So, so what is a person to God the Spirit? Home. And the most amazing home that, that there is. In Scripture, God has the Israelites, remember, construct a tent or a tabernacle that then becomes a stone temple that Jesus somehow destroys and rebuilds, that John sees descending from heaven as a bride that is a body that is you. The temple is a description of the human soul. All souls. And your soul. And check this out. In the depth of the temple is an inner sanctuary. And behind the curtain, the breath of God, the Spirit of God, the life that is God. When a person comes to Christ, because Christ has come to them, that curtain is ripped. They're exiled from that place. But when Christ comes to them, that curtain is ripped from the top to the bottom, and the Spirit of God wells up in them as the fountain of eternal life, of living water, and it begins to fill the temple from the inside out. The true self fills the emptiness of the false self with infinite mercy, which is the very substance of the eternal God. And God is forever at home there. That's, a, that's amazing. That's Andrew. And you know, Andrew is uh, <laughs> Andrew's like a brother to me. I didn't pick him. He just showed up at my house one day in, in high school. He's different than me. I don't think Andrew and I have voted for the same person for what, at least a decade or something like that. He's different than me, but <laughs> Andrew is me. When I see Andrew, I see me. And I think when Andrew sees me, he sees himself, and that recognition is, is joy, as they say in the East, the divine in me recognizes the divine in him. Namaste, namaste. As Paul writes in Scripture, we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh, the own individual flesh, or as the ESV puts it, no one according to a human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. And now this is the thing that I think is most amazing to me. Andrew confesses his sins to me. 
and I uh, confess my sins to Andrew. And so I know that Andrew is made of dirt. And yet in Andrew, I have encountered the spirit of the living God. I wasn't going to say this, but actually in my quiet times, I usually picture myself with my head on God's chest. And it's a memory of Andrew holding me when I was excommunicated, holding me. That's weird, huh? But Andrew is like a treasure, you see, buried in a field. He's like a pearl found in a slimy oyster in the depths of the sea. Andrew is like the stinky manger that contains the Christ child. He's like a tomb from which I get to witness the resurrection of the Christ. So what is a person to God the Father? Eternal treasure. And what is a person to God the Son himself? And what is a person to God the Spirit? His own body wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. His own self rising from billions of tombs and all coming together in absolute joy. And so Jesus turns to Peter and asks, what is that to you, Peter? What is John to you? A problem? An accusation? A threat? A curse? Or Christmas? And Easter? And a great banquet that will never end? What is John to you? What is Andrew to you? What am I to you, asked Jesus? Am I hell? Or am I heaven? What is that to you, asked Jesus? And then he says, follow me. When we follow Jesus, we will find him in our neighbor and discover that we all are one and that one, that one is an eternal treasure, a body, a temple, a, a kingdom, a great banquet of absolute joy. So what is that to you, asked Jesus? What is your neighbor to you, asked Jesus? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you laid down your life, and you didn't just lay down your life, you gave us your life. Your life is, the Spirit is life, says Scripture, and you gave us your life so that we would give it to our neighbor, so that, uh, Lord God, we would construct, that we would be used by you to construct your kingdom. And so, Jesus, I thank you that that's not a, that's not an if, that's just, it's already happened. And I pray that you would help us to walk in it, that you would help us to believe the gospel, not just by ourselves, but together as your body. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord God, amen. So listen, th these are some things that I'm asking of you, okay? Um, uh, go out of your way to, to, get to, know, to get to know Chris. And uh, also make yourself uh, available, would you? Um, this has been such a weird time, and I feel like God has been orchestrating all of it. I mean, it's all, I see his hand all over the place. Um, but it's been a strange time as we've kind of been deconstructed by a pandemic and people moving, all sorts of things. And um, I'm praying that we can be reconstructed now. And uh, God constructs us with each other, and there really is treasure all around you. I have to keep reminding myself of that, that it's just true of every person. There's this treasure in that dirt, and uh, God wants us to discover it. So um, I'm asking you to kind of make your, yourself available. Uh, Francis is going to be back in a couple months, which is great. It's a weird time to bring someone in and train them in community life when community life is semi-illegal. Well, that's weird. Um, but uh, we feel like this is a great opportunity. So that would be awesome. And then also never look at anyone the same again. All right? That's the point. Um, do you got two minutes? Can I read this to you real quick? Okay, you can stay saying this isn't long. But Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk, a Roman Catholic monk. And he had this experience in Louisville, Kentucky, and I just, I think it's so great. I wanted to read it to you at the end of the sermon. He writes, In Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I was theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. 
This sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. And I suppose my happiness could have taken form in the words, thank God, thank God that I am like other men, that I am only a man among others. I have the immense joy of being a man, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate. As if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me now that I realize that we, what we all are, and if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around like shining like the sun. Then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach the core of their reality, the person that each one of us is in God's eyes. If only they could all see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other the way all the time, that way all the time. There would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. We must not worship each other. <laughs> but we must worship the God who lives in each other. So in Jesus' name, let's believe the gospel together. Amen.